here we're going to present on our application called Fracture, Fire Resource Area Coverage and Time to Response. So we created a website that hosts three different maps. Um, two of them are about um, response times from fire stations across the state. And um, one of them looks into water resources. Um, so here we go. Um, just let us know if our internet drops. Housing's in Scotland right now, and apparently there's a storm coming. So just, yeah, please bear with us. And we're also new to Microsoft Teams. So we're going to do our best. So this is a small video that we wanted to show you. Um, and Hassan is going to talk about it a little bit afterwards. I'll just let it play for one minute. A fire. In your lifetime, you have a one in four chance of experiencing a fire serious enough to call 911 for help. Everyone takes comfort in knowing that when we need help, someone will answer the call. But who is that someone? Who is that someone? If you live in the same town that I do, that someone is me. I'm an animator, and I'm also a volunteer firefighter. When there is an emergency, a dispatcher pages a group of volunteers, and we drop what we're doing and we go. This is how it's done in most of America. 70% of all firefighters in this country are volunteers. Smaller communities are especially reliant on volunteers. In communities of under 25,000 people, 95% of the firefighters that serve them are volunteers. In communities of under 2,500, 99.5% of the firefighters are volunteers. Um, so that video was created, like you heard, by a Vermont firefighter um, and really just showcases that, you know, most of Vermont is um, serviced by volunteer firefighters. There are about 236 departments across Vermont with different types, career, volunteer, combination, um, servicing urban and rural areas. They use, we use different water resources and we respond to all different types of calls. Um, with increasing fuel loads and an influx of new Vermonters, there's an ever more need for more firefighters. Um, so our application is hopefully a tool for all Vermonters that we hope will sort of bring the public and the fire service closer together and maybe even recruit new volunteers. So this is us, um, I'm John, this is Halcyon. Thank you again for the introduction. Um, we created this project in the context of our spring computer science senior seminar class. So this was kind of a capstone project, sort of a culminating project um, to pretty much our experience here at Middlebury so far. So without further ado, we're just gonna hop right into a demonstration of the tool. Um, so I'm gonna change up my screen sharing real quickly. Let's see. Factor. There we go. Can you see that, Halcyon? Yep, all set. Okay, awesome. So this is our website. Um, that's our, our small URL, the, 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 the name of the website. Uh, we called it smokeandmaps.com, just sort of a fun joke, I suppose. Um, but that's the that's the address you can use to visit our website, smokeandmaps.com. Um, this is what you would see when you first land on the website. So there's a navbar at the top um, with a few different maps that we're going to showcase. And then if you scroll down, it tells you a little bit about just some context. Why are these maps important, at least in, in our view? Um, kind of the building process. So what were the methods and the tools that we used to build these maps? Uh, we're going to dive a little bit later into this presentation as well about the ethical implications that we kind of foresee about this tool. And then just some uh, fire safety resources that would be useful, especially for the public when, you know, somebody just comes that doesn't really know much about the fire service, just hops on, onto the website and views the project. Um, and then at the bottom here, there's a couple important links. Uh, the first is the, uh, is the link to our GitHub repositories. GitHub is a code sharing platform in case uh, anybody didn't know. And that's kind of where all of the code that is um, 
that is used to create this website and these maps. That's where all that is stored, as well as the data. So all of our data is public and it's kind of located on these public GitHub repositories. Um, and the second link is this project report PDF uh, that we had to write at the end of our, for the class, at the end of the class. Um, and that kind of summarizes everything, again, from the methods, goes into detail about things like limitations. Um, so everything is in there. So now let's just hop into the maps. Um, the first map we want to showcase is this one. So that would be, uh, we're looking at response times from fire stations around Vermont, um, kind of bounded by what the, by the fire department service zones. So I'm going to go ahead. There's kind of a lot going on, so I'll just toggle a few things off for now. Um, these are interactive maps. That's kind of why we, we, we design them this way. Um, we want people to be able to just interact them, with them easily. So the lines in red here, those are the Department Emer Emergency Service Zones. Uh, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with these. Uh, if not, they're basically zones that the state of Vermont kind of delineated and they outline jurisdiction, in this case, for fire departments. So it's really, um, for example, I'm going to zoom in on Middlebury College in a second. So there's kind of a, a handy search tool up here. Um, so if I look at Middlebury College. Uh, here we go. It sort of it places a small waypoint on that location that we just zoomed on. So that's a college, and so this right here is the Middlebury Fire Department service zone, and that means that Middlebury's fire department fire stations. There's two fire stations in Middlebury, um, which I can turn on. There's the there's the normal Middlebury station right here, and then there's the East Middlebury station, um, and so these two stations they primarily respond to incidents that take place within that zone. Um, so that's why we've, we're kind of delineating, um, we're, we're using the zones. Now, just looking at these layers here, so these shapes, this one is how long it takes. Um, so this is how far you can get, excuse me, uh, from one of these fire stations within two minutes. So that's kind of the coverage, how much is covered um, in, in a two minute you know, zone in terms of just driving time. Um, so if you drove a truck from the station, you would get to any of these points within two minutes. Um, then we sort of have, we can kind of toggle these on, on and off, and this is the five minute uh, layer, so that's a little bit bigger, covers a, a, a sizable chunk of, of the zone. Um, we see, for instance, on Route 7, that's sort of, that's a faster road, so a lot, there's a lot more that's covered there. There's some overlap between the two stations, so both can get to those points um, in under five minutes. And then if we turn on this 10 minute layer, for instance, um, that's pretty much most of the zone is kind of covered. Uh, that's great to see. And then in 20 minutes, that's that's all of the zone is covered. Um, so again, one thing that you can do is you can toggle these stations right here like this, um, and it'll give you the information about so the, the name of the station and the, or the fire department, as well as the type. So it will tell you if this is a volunteer department. Um, the ones in Middlebury are run, are run mostly by volunteers. And then up here in Burlington, that's where you would see your career stations. Um, so we've color coded them as well. So the orange ones are career stations, and then the ones in red are just volunteer run. Um, and then career, so the, and the career stations, that's where firefighters would take overnight shifts. And they're kind of ready to go at any second, as the idea. Um, and then this one in purple up here, uh, this is in St. Albans, that is a combination. So this combination of firefighters who, who work shifts there, and then also rely on volunteers. Uh, is there anything else for this map possible that you can think of? We're all set. Cool. Okay, and then just kind of above and below the map, we have some context. Again, here it's about these emergency service zones and that this response time being bounded by those. Um, and down here is just some information about how to navigate the map. So you can kind of read that on your, on your own time. So the second map is the response times across Vermont. So kind of forgetting about these emergency service zones, if we were to simply assume that the, the fire station that is the nearest to an incident is the first to respond, what does that coverage look like? Um, and it's going to look more dense for sure. Um, so let me just toggle some things off again. You can look up Middlebury down here, Middlebury College. And I, I can also, I, we also have these fire department emergency service zones that you can just toggle on um, sort of to have uh, um, to be able to view. So then, for, for example, the five minutes, um, now it looks like 
the again, if we're assuming that states that trucks from the middleware station can respond to anywhere in the surrounding within the nearest you know five minutes of all arounds, uh, well, they can respond to places outside of the zone. So, for instance, over here, Belden, Belden Falls, um, Middlebury typically would not respond there except if there was a mutual aid um, call that was put out by the neighboring department and the neighboring zone. Um, but again, if you if you sort of take away these these zones, obviously the coverage um, is going to be broader, and you're going to have access quicker access to some of these areas. Um, so that's sort of the idea. And then just kind of looking at the state, I could toggle uh, this 10 minute layer, um, a lot of coverage, and then likewise with the 20 minutes, um, pretty much the whole state is covered, uh, except for like the Green Mountains, obviously, um, that's, you know, difficult access terrain. And then in the Northeast Kingdom as well, there's some missing coverage kind of. So yeah, that's that's sort of the idea. Um, additionally, we included a satellite base map. Um, so you can kind of turn this on. And this is useful for looking at structures. Um, so let's, let me zoom in again on Middlebury. The website is a little bit slow. This is because a lot of data is loaded um, and it's sort of parsing through all those features. But you have to kind of give it a second. And then, so if I turn on the five minutes, we could see, okay, yeah, it looks like most of these big structures are kind of covered. I think this is a quarry over here. Um, so yeah, that's just additional information is these base maps. I think that's it for this one. And then lastly, uh, so we have we included again response times from fire stations, which we're going to walk through a little bit afterwards on like how we how we how we built those layers. Uh, but now we have hydrants, so we mapped fire hydrants yeah. from the state. You know, kind of considering once um, once a, once a fire truck gets the, gets to the scene, can do they have access to the resources that they need in order to put out a fire, for instance? Um, so this map, there's a lot of data points loaded. There's thousands of hydrants around the state. Um, I recommend when you first load it, disabling this municipal hydrants um, layer, because that's that's kind of most of the hydrants. So I would say just, you know, the first time you load it, just kind of turn it off and it'll help things load faster. Um, but then if we zoom in on the bottom, you'll see there's a legend telling you uh, that we basically color coded the hydrants by flow rate. Um, so for instance, I can zoom in onto this orange one. Uh, I think it was up here somewhere. Okay, I'll just go with I'll just go with one of the green ones here. Mm. So one second. Um, yeah. Okay. So then, what you can do is you can click on the small circle, and it'll give you information about the hydrant, such as the hydrant ID number, um, what type of hydrant this is. In this case, this is a dry hydrant. Um, and then we've again the flow rate color. So it says green, and that's the color of the circle. So you can kind of look at the legend and see, okay, this hydrant its flow rate is between 1,000 to 1,500 gallons per minute. So that's this just kind of gives you a sense of the resources available um, on scene. And we've drawn these circles around these hydrants um, because so the circles are of radius 600 feet. So we're sort of considering that if if a structure is within 600 feet of a hydrant, that it's protected or it's within Easy, you know, easy reach um, by a fire truck uh, to kind of plug in, you know, connect to the hydrant, get the water, and use that within that area. Um, yeah, we can, and we're going to walk a little bit through this number again later. But this is just to give you a sense of things. Um, I'll just zoom out, and then again, I can toggle all these layers individually. You should, you should definitely pull up the website and play with this on your own time. This is, I'm just kind of giving a demonstration. Um, and the moment I turn on the municipal hydrants, things will slow down a little bit. But it should be, it should still be navigable. Um, and this, this is, this just sort of shows all the hydrants in, in municipalities and towns. Most of those hydrants, we don't know the flow rate for them because the data didn't come with it. So they're just in gray. That's hydrants with unknown flow rate. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. So that's our website. Um, now I'm going to return to the demo, to the PowerPoint, excuse me. Awesome. Was there anything else about the website? Um, 
Anything? Yeah, that's a great demo. I think that um, the other thing is it is viewable on mobile devices, but it's just a lot harder to interact with the maps on your phones. Um, so we really recommend um, looking, at, looking at them on the computer. And um, Chrome and Firefox are kind of the best browsers for it, too. Mm -hmm. I'm having a bit of trouble sharing PowerPoints. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay, slides. That should work. Can you see that, Hassan? Yes, we're all good. Cool. Okay, so when John and I were thinking about uh, creating this project, first of all, we really wanted an interdisciplinary project that would bring together emergency response and our backgrounds in computer science and geography. And we wanted to use this capstone project as an opportunity to work with local partners and give back to the community that has welcomed us for the past four years. Um, so we started off with like thinking about mapping response times from the Middlebury stations. And um, we were also interested in determining sort of what, what areas are cover, more covered, what areas are less covered from fire for service resources. And ultimately we wanted to learn more uh, about mapping tools and techniques and working with open source data that's available to everyone. Um, so to do this project, we collaborated with the Middlebury College, obviously the computer science department, also the geography department. We also spent time talking with Chief David Schott, the Middlebury Fire Department, and firefighter Brett Wilhelm. Um, and we were definitely under the guidance of Andrew LaRoe, who's also a Middlebury firefighter and works at the Addison County Regional Planning Commission. Um, so our top priority when we were thinking about building this website that's kind of based on um, algorithms was that we wanted it, all of our code and our process and data to be open source and available to the public. Um, we wanted our methods to be transparent and reproducible by anyone who would want to take this code and tailor it to their specific needs. Um, we wanted it to be accessible to the public, to fire departments, and to emergency management. Um, and we wanted to add to a growing collection of algorithms that are already being used in the fire service. Um, some of those include um, Firebird, which was developed by G Georgia Tech and the Data Science for Social Good in Atlanta Fire Rescue, um, which creates maps that prioritize building inspections based on building fire risk. Um, algorithms are also used for station location problems, so determining where the most effective location is for new stations or hospitals. Um, and artificial intelligence is being used um, to detect wildland fires using satellite and drone sensors. In terms of the data that we're portraying on our website right now, um, we got most of it from the Vermont Geodata Portal, which is a public resource. Um, anybody can download most of the data on there. Um, specifically, we're pulling from a data set called the E911 data set. Um, it includes kind of the fire department, emergency service zones that, were, that we showed, showed on the website, um, the structure, so the stations, the coordinates of all the stations around Vermont, and also the coordinates of the hydrants. And it also has information um, such as for the hydrants, it will have like flow rate or just other complementary information. Um, and lastly, we're also using the state of Vermont um, kind of geometry shape, um, just from, from the geographic perspective. And then um, we also collected, we also were in touch with the Vermont Division of Fire Safety, who kindly gave us access to um, the fire department types. So we got to see, okay, we got a list of the stations by whether they were career run or volunteer run um, or combinations. So we, that's pretty much all the data that we're working with. Um, yeah. um, so now I'm gonna explain sort of how we calculated the response times. Um, so we were using a program called OpenStreetMaps, which gave us the street networks for across the entire state of Vermont. Um, and using those street networks, we were able to start out with the station coordinates. And from there, we were able to determine, you know, if a truck or an engine traveling at the speed limit, um, how far could they get in two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, and 20 minutes. So that kind of created our zones that we see here. Um, now these do not take in, do not include the time that it takes to travel to the station. So especially for volunteers that are having to drive from their homes or places of work to the stations first and then respond from there, that does not include that extra travel time. Um, they also are not based on historical call data, and they 
don't include differences in station resources like number of personnel or apparatus. Um, so next, uh, we took sort of those response time zones that we created in the step previous, and we used the emergency service zones that John talked about, and we sort of cookie cuttered the response times so that we um, were limiting them by the emergency service zones. So here you see that sort of the Middlebury uh, response time areas are um, limited by their emergency service zones here. In terms of fire hydrant coverage, um, again, the process for putting these on the website was quite straightforward. We fetched the coordinates from those data sets. Um, then we drew the, cir the circle around each hydrant of radius 600 feet. Um, for the, again, for that number, we were in touch with uh, Middlebury Fire Department Chief David Shaw, and he sort of told us that, uh, you know, roughly 600 feet is about a reasonable estimate of how far away a fire truck should be or could be um, in order to have access to that hydrant. And then lastly, we colored those kind of circles by the flow rate to give additional information when you're looking at it. Um, and there's the ability to toggle those hydrants by hydrant type, like I showed in the demo. Um, so now we're just going to kind of explain how this tool can be used by the public, by firefighters, and by emergency management. Um, so first of all, for the public, we're hoping that it can sort of provide a risk assessment. So people can ask, you know, how covered is my home? What resources are near me? Um, hopefully it will prompt homeowners to contact their local fire departments if they have questions or concerns. And hopefully it will also prompt them to seek um, fire prevention education resources. Um, so ultimately we're hoping that this tool will encourage more interaction between the public and the fire service, which hopefully down the road could lead to um, volunteer recruitment. Um, and we are also hoping that, you know, homeowners, new homeowners can be informed when they're purchasing a home in Vermont um, as far as um, how covered it is by their local fire departments. Um, for firefighters, we're thinking of this as mostly an educational tool, um, useful especially for people who are new to the area or who are going through driver training, leadership training. Um, I think it stresses the sort of importance of knowing the fastest route to calls. We all know, know that a couple minutes can really make a big difference. Um, I think it could be useful in pre-planning. Um, so knowing how far away important or hazardous structures are located, for example, schools, hospitals, elderly living and hazardous material sites. Right now you can kind of use the search feature and the satellite layer to identify these locations. In the future, you know, we'd like to have a layer that would include important sites. Um, we think that this tool could also be used to prompt discussions on firefighter response methods. So perhaps firefighters living in harder to reach areas could respond directly to the scene. Um, that's just an example. Um, and it's also just for asking ourselves as fire departments if, if our departments and its resources can satisfy the needs of our jurisdictions. Uh, and then finally, for emergency management, um, again, all the data files in the code are available um, for free and, and you know, uh, publicly on our GitHub repositories. Um, we think this could maybe be useful for placing new stations, so determining, you know, going ahead, um, looking at sort of the areas that are perhaps less covered or that could, you know, could use more coverage, where could new stations be placed or, or where could resources be allocated. Um, considering kind of coverage as well as housing said of key sites and structures like schools, um, locations that have hazardous materials, etc. Um, there may be potential use for this during larger incidents, uh, just considering, okay, what are the nearest stations where, you know, just geographically looking at them on a map, what, what do we see, wh uh, what's the closest, um, and then lastly, the hydrant map can just be used to evaluate existing locations. Um, I believe some hydrants were missing from the ENN1 data sets. So, and I think there is a way to report missing hydrants. Um, but anyway, so people who maintain those data sets and those hydrants, they can kind of use use those maps to just complete their knowledge of, of those data. So in terms of limitations, uh, we already touched on most of these, but again, this is not a perfect tool. Um, right now, the response times are only considering vehicle travel times. So just, you know, from this fire station, how quickly can we get to, to how far, basically? Um, you know, within two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, and 20 minutes. And, but this doesn't take into account the time it takes for 
you know, for firefighters to get to the station, to grab their gear, hop in the trucks, et cetera. Um, we could imagine that for career-based stations, so where firefighters work shifts, that those times are more accurate um, because, you know, in that case, the firefighters can just hop in the trucks pretty much with, you know, maybe a minute or two minutes of, of um, delay or some, some, some sort and then just go. So that, that might be pretty accurate. But then for volunteer stations, that number would be off. Um, so we want to try and consider going ahead how to uh, count, you know, take into account these buffer times. Um, and then we're also, there are also like certain factors that are not considered, such as weather, traffic. Um, yeah, there's just a number of parameters that our algorithms don't represent currently. So this is just, these are just supposed to give up an estimate. Um, right now our maps only, they kind of make it seem as though each station is kind of similar, is equipped with the same resources, which is not true. You know, different stations have different, um, different equipments. They're equipped to respond to different types of incidents, um, different numbers of crew, et cetera. So going ahead, we'd like to try to figure out how to um, display those based on resources per station. Um, and then I believe there, well, we know that there are a couple of missing stations. Um, I believe one in the Northeast Kingdom somewhere. Uh, we'll have to check. But yeah, there's, for the most part, we have pretty much all the stations, but there could be a couple of missing data points. So those are kind of some of the main limitations um, with our tools. Is this, how soon should I keep going with this? Uh, I'll just, I'll just go ahead. Um, so again, just as I said, we want to reinforce and, and state again that the algorithms are not representative of the real situations. Um, each fire, each fire department kind of does things differently. In some cases, the volunteers, they just drive straight to the scene. In other cases, somebody, you know, has to go back to the station, grab the truck and go. Um, so the, this tool is really just informative and is not representative. And we don't mean it in any way to be some sort of a replacement to anything. This is just additional information that we want to make available um, with the fire departments in Vermont. Um, so as far as ethical implications go, um, like John said, really just internalizing that this is a tool based on algorithms and that doesn't necessarily equate to real life. Um, the other is to realize uh, that this could have an impact on the housing market, potentially, you know, someone trying to sell their home who lives in a more remote area that's not as well covered might have a harder time doing so. Or um, insurance agencies could use this to change their calculations or rates. They perform very similar calculations that we've been doing. Um, and also, you know, a tool like this uh, could be used in the ongoing debate about fire department regionalization in Vermont. In terms of future work for this project, um, the first priority would be resolving some uh, accuracy imperfections. So that we think could mostly be done through access to more data, which we'll talk about next. Um, performing some kind of some data analytics, so looking at some sort of a breakdown of you know population density, what, how much of the population is is within two minutes, within five minutes, etc., and then maybe even then of those of the population, are there additional criteria that we can use to break down these populations and see okay, it looks like these minorities or these communities are underserved. Um, or over, you know, overprotected. Yeah. So just kind of performing some analytics would be really interesting. Um, again, for emergency management, some sort of a station, new station selection tool to figure out, okay, you know, if we were to place additional stations, where could those go? Or if we were to consolidate stations, which ones would make the most sense? Um, a map layer of key locations and sites would be interesting, like Halsey mentioned. So schools, hospitals, kind of just some waypoints and pop-ups on the map would be helpful. Um, this is uh, a potential idea, but some, you know, making this tool available for other states or other municipalities to use. Um, perhaps those those other municipalities can just kind of plug in their own data. Um, if that were to work, that would that would be pretty interesting. But again, we have to reinforce, you know, this this is very uh, situational. Um, take this based on context. These numbers are reasonably accurate and may not be the most accurate. So just you know, considering that. Um, and then one last idea was, for instance. Um, any user could just hop on the website and then see, okay, what is the closest route or what, what is the fastest route to the closest fire station from me? So some sort of like a small routing path would be interesting. Uh, these are just some ideas for future extensions. And again, so to improve the accuracy of this, um, something like gaining call history data per station or per department could be helpful. 
um, if we could determine, you know, look, looking at the past, looking at the history for this station, it looks like it took about um, X minutes to get everybody to the station, and then, you know, Y minutes to kind of drive to this location, then we could start incorporating things like those buffer, unaccounted for buffer times. Um, and yeah, just again, it's it really depends per station. So a lot of work would have to go into that, but data would certainly help improve the accuracy. Um, things like resources, staffing, and station inventory per stations. So maybe using that, we could somehow represent um, how equipped each station is on that map to respond to different uh, scenarios. Um, having prior knowledge about the department response protocol, again, whether volunteers respond directly to the scene or they go to the station or just kind of what the deal is there. Um, and lastly, obviously, developers and people to help out. Uh, that's about it for our presentation. We would like to thank Professor Andrea Vicari from the Middlebury uh, Computer Science Department, who was our advisor on this project and was extremely helpful. Um, Andrew LaRoe, who worked for the um, Addison County Regional Planning Commission and really helped us with this project. Uh, Middlebury Fire Department Chief David Shaw, who gave us a lot of helpful tips. Um, we'd also like to thank the Middlebury College Computer Science and Geography Departments um, and, Vermont Emergency, and the Vermont Emergency Preparedness Conference. Uh, we'd like to thank Deputy Director of the Division of Fire Safety, Robert Sponable, for his input on our presentation and also Hillary Scott, the state training administrator for helping us put it together.